Well, I am going to get ready to begin, and I'll do that by sharing my screen tonight. And as I share my screen, talk a little bit about what tonight is about. Uh, we want to con conclude our series on uh, focus. And tonight, we're going to focus on, hey, I like that word, focus on, right? We're going to focus on uh, distractions. We're going to talk about distractions and focus. Uh, before we get to that, I certainly want to thank God for uh, the Reverend Nikita Bethel Smith. I know that she uh, prayed heaven in and down uh, for us tonight. She is one of God's gifts. Uh, and of course, it will not be the last time that we hear from her uh, at the People's Church, God willing. Um, she is a powerful woman of God. Uh, unfortunately, I could not make the prayer call. I was on the phone with the state uh, just up until right before this Bible study. Um, and just a few seconds ago, they called again. Um, but we were talking about some other things with regards to our new vaccination. I didn't get a chance to hear her, but I've heard her before. Uh, she's preached before. But as a matter of fact, literally uh, almost one year ago to this day, uh, she preached in the Bahamas. And uh, she left us all with our mouths wide open, uh, being the preaching gift that she is. She said one thing that was so powerful, uh, I never will forget. She said she talked about Judas. And she said that Judas did not develop overnight. Judas developed over time. And that thing spoke to our hearts so profoundly because when we thought about Judas, um, you know, he's gotten a bad rap. But we also understand that Judas is that we have in our life and are connected to us. Usually are not people who just come and go. They're people who are next to us. And so talked about guarding our heart. Never forget that. So uh, we'll be hearing more from her. And if you missed her, I'm sure we'll find a way to get her connected back to the People's Church uh, that you can hear one more time. But tonight, talking about distractions and focus, uh, we're going to focus on our assignment tonight. All right. And um, I'm going to go to the screen again. And so if you will, I want to uh, look a little bit tonight. I want to focus on the word distractions. And um, when we talk about the word distraction, um, here's the word distraction defined. Um, number one, it's the, art, the act of distracting or drawing apart to create distractions among us, right? That's one definition of distractions. Another definition of distractions are that which diverts attention or causes a diversion. The third definition of uh, distractions is a diversity of direction, and it's also known as detachment. And then also, the fourth is the state in which attention is called in different ways, causing confusion or perplexity. And these are the definitions of distraction. And so if you find yourself distracted, I'm sure that you can find yourself in one of these definitions. Um, and so uh, the reason that we want to take the time to talk about distractions is because for so many of us, if we could just be brutally honest, um, that when we talk about distractions, one of the things is that all of us have become victim to distractions. Um, if you're on this on this Bible study tonight, I'm sure you'll be able to testify and you'll say, sanctified, Holy Ghost, fire, fill, fire, baptized self, that all of us have been hit with distractions in one way or another. And so our goal tonight is to understand a little bit more about distractions, understanding a little bit more about distractions and focus, because if we're trying to make this year the best year, if we're trying to overcome this pandemic, and not just overcome the pandemic from a health perspective, but to be able to overcome the pandemic from a, from a mental perspective, an emotional perspective, a psychological and spiritual perspective. In order to do that, we are going to also have to be able to overcome distractions. When you think about the things that have gone on politically over the course of the last four years, a lot of people have been affected, affected, traumatized, um, beaten up, right? And if we don't pay particular attention uh, to guarding against distractions, we will live in a state of perpetual uh, 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 for too long. God does not want us to be in this state of perpetual distraction. He wants us to walk in our destiny. And anytime that we've got destiny, destiny 
always will be challenged by distraction. All right, I'll come back and share a little bit more. Destiny will always be challenged by distraction. I'll give you an appetizer. Have you ever thought about your spiritual walk or you've walked in your spiritual purpose to the place that now when you start walking in your spiritual purpose and doing what God has called you to do, all of a sudden, you now find that distractions come and present themselves to you, taking you away from what you have purposed and intended to do for God. You can say amen. All of us have had that experience where we can become distracted. But if all of us understand that distractions are a part of or are, are a part towards our destiny, that we'll understand how to handle distractions, we'll understand how to overcome distractions, and we'll understand distractions from a better perspective. Amen. All right, moving a little bit further, uh, let us go tonight uh, as we talk about this thing called distractions. Uh, let me go to our next slide. And here it is. Distractions and, tempt and temptation, right? I say we don't want to admit it, but the truth is, is that distraction is a temptation. Distraction is a temptation to give and take the focus and energy needed for something highly important or significant. Distractions will also present themselves on a daily basis with people, places, and things. So as I said to you before, Distraction is a temptation, and it takes the focus and the energy from something highly important or significant. And, um, you know, they'll present themselves on a daily basis with people, places, and things. Now, before you go to Nehemiah chapter number six, I'll reverse it because I think I put it in, uh, out of order. Let us go, if you will, uh, to Matthew chapter number four. And if you come to Matthew chapter number four... Let's go to Matthew chapter number four. And uh, let me see here. Uh, I don't have gallery view. I see Reverend Cargill in plain view. So uh, Reverend, would you lead? And then Rhoda, um, give, you'll read the next scripture. And then Tasha, you'll have the third one as well. I don't get to see who else is on here. All righty. Let us go. Uh, Matthew chapter number four. All right. And we'll go from there. Which verses? Um, you can read. Well, you know, you can read one through one through 11. It's fine. Matthew chapter four. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right, stop right there, Reverend. So I just got finished talking to you about distractions are a temptation, right? And so here it is, Jesus is in the wilderness after 40 days and 40 nights when we know that Satan enters in to ask him to command these stones to be made bread, right? He tempts him. It's a temptation. It's a temptation that comes to Jesus. Keep going, uh, Reverend. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. Oh, okay, stop there. And so here we got the devil coming again and asking him, saying to him, what? The devil takes him and he asks him, if you be the son of God, Cast yourself down, right? So last week I talked to you about knowing who you are and whose you are. Here comes the temptation. Jesus, if you're the son of God, 
do this, right? If you're the son of God, cast yourself down. Well, Jesus doesn't fall for the temptation and Jesus doesn't fall for the distraction, even though the temptation and the distraction is aimed at him proving who he is. I don't have time to go here tonight, but a lot of us waste a whole lot of time trying to prove ourselves to other people. Distraction. Trying to help ourselves and get ourselves to a place where we're trying to prove to people who we are or who God says we are. I need to help you. Sometimes when God tells you who you are, everybody's not going to believe you. When God tells you who you are, everybody's not going to rock with you. When God tells you who you are, everybody may not recognize it, but you don't have to spend a whole lot of time being distracted and being tempted because here it is. You can fall into the temptation so heavy that you work so hard trying to prove yourself to somebody else instead of being the person that God has called you to be that will ultimately prove yourself towards everybody. Am I helping? So we've got to understand, don't allow certain temptations and distractions to take place. Keep going, Reverend. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall not worship the Lord your God. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. And verse 11, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Wow. All right. So here it is in Matthew chapter number four, we get a good example. But who is the example? The example is Jesus. Jesus is tempted 40 days after being in the wilderness. He's tempted by the devil. And the devil's job is to distract and tempt Jesus. Come on with me tonight. If the devil can distract and tempt Jesus, how much more does he not aim to distract and tempt you? If he can't get Jesus, he can certainly get the ones who are closest to him. If he can't get Jesus, he can certainly get to the ones in the family. So what do we have to do? We have to guard ourselves to understand this. Here it is. Jesus was tempted to become distracted. If it happened to Jesus, it's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to all of us, right? Our job is to know who we are and whose we are so that we're not distracted. Because anytime that you become so distracted, um, here it is. If Jesus would have done what he wanted him to do, he would have fallen off the cliff. I need you to know that's what temptation and distraction is, wants you to do. It wants you to fall off the cliff and fall away from your purpose, your destiny, your assignment, the thing that God has prepared for you. And if we could just be honest, how many of us can say, okay, uh-huh, I got some cuts and scrapes on my knees already because I've been done fell off the cliff before, Pastor, and I've fallen off the cliff and gotten away from my purpose, my destiny, my assignment. It's the assignment of the enemy to bring distraction into your life. It's the assignment of the enemy to tempt you with distraction. Be not deceived. The greatest thing that can keep us from walking in our purpose and our destiny is distraction. Not just the distraction that the enemy presents. I'll come back to this in a few, but sometimes we create our own distractions. I'm coming back later. All right, moving right along. So here we go. I gave you a scripture reference of distractions and temptations, Nehemiah chapter number six. I probably did it out of order, 
but hang with me. All right? Distractions are not bad, I say, as they are constantly presented. However, distractions can become bad when we give way to them. And so instead of going to Matthew chapter number four, what I want us to do is go to Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, and go over to Nehemiah chapter number six. And when you get to Nehemiah chapter number six, uh, go ahead there and uh, begin to read uh, Nehemiah chapter number six. But we're going to wait a few seconds, uh, daughter, for uh, for that to take place so that the saints might be able to all be on one accord in God's word. Nehemiah chapter number six. All righty. What verses? Oh, that would be important, right? All right, let's go with uh verses one through three. Sambala, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained. Though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates, so Sambala and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ano. But but I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them: "I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come." Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? All right, keep going. Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sambala's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations that in Geshem tells me that it is true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You have you can be very sure that this report will be will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. All right, stop right there. So here's the, here it is. Nehemiah is building a wall, right? The Bible says he's building the wall. And as he's building the wall, he's building the wall for God. And the Bible says there's no gaps in the wall, right? There's no gaps in the wall. And Nehemiah is building this wall for God. And then the Bible says, Symbolic comes to them and says, listen, uh, Nehemiah, do me a favor, bro. Stop building the wall and come down to the village and let's have a let's have a conversation. Now watch how uh, the mode de operandi of the distractor. Nehemiah's building the wall is going good. There's no gaps in it. Everything's going well. Sambalot says, "Listen, come on down to the village and let's talk this thing out." Nehemiah recognizes that this brother is really trying to distract him. And he says, no, I'm not coming to the village. Hello, somebody. Uh, let me use this out. Don't be distracted by village people. Okay? There's always somebody in the village who's out there trying to get you. And what Nehemiah says, I'm doing a great work. And I'm not coming down off the wall. Hello, somebody. Village people will always kill the great work. They have an assignment to distract. They have an assignment to get you to come down. Hello. And when you work so hard to get to a place, Lord knows there's always somebody who wants to pull you down. As I, I preached this before. New levels bring new devils. The higher you go, the higher the aim of the adversary. 
He always wants to bring you down. And so here it is. Symbolic says, I'm going to bring you down. Here we're coming down and we're going to come down and let's talk this thing out. Right? Then that doesn't work. The Bible says that he sends after four other times. Now, that ain't work one time. They send it four other times. And then the fifth time, it says, verse number six, read verse number six. There is a rumor among the... I don't need no more. Here it is. If they can't get you, the next step is to start a rumor about you. Distraction. God, I thank you. You see, if they can't get to you personally, then what they do is they start a rumor about you to get to you. Hello. But can I tell you something? Nobody grows in God chasing down rumors and gossip. You can spend so much time chasing rumors and gossip that you get out of the purpose and the plan and the will of God for your life. Can I help you? This is why I want to help you, right? Because I wasn't always saved. And I was saved. And even being saved, I spent time having, trying to chase down rumors and gossip. But I know it's a common denominator when you start chasing down rumors and gossip. The moment you confront the person that says the rumor and the gossip, and they sure enough done said it, the moment they always find a way to deny it. Nobody ever owns up to what they say. Here it is, you have spent all your time and all your energy hoping to get to the person to get to a thing where so well, would you well that ain't what I said. It ain't really what I said. This, that, that, well, that ain't really what I meant. That's a okay. How much energy did you exert? Have you have you ever done that before? No, if you ever done that before, you can put your hand up. Let me see if you ever done that before. You ever chased anything down before? Hello. You put your hand up, right? What did it turn out to be? It's a distraction, right? Nehemiah is working while other people are talking. You got to keep on working and walking while other people are talking. If you are trying to cease to talk before you walk, you will live in a perpetual state of distraction. You're trying to cease to talk so that you can walk. Well, I need you to know something. If you keep on walking, no matter what distraction, I mean, no matter what you do, guess what? They're going to keep on talking. If you're walking good, they're going to talk about you. If you're walking bad, they're going to talk about you. If you're walking in between, they're going to talk about you. But I'd rather do the walking while the people are doing the talking because that puts more distance between me and them. Come on, somebody. You got to learn how to put distance between your distractors. You got to learn how to keep on walking in the face of people who are still talking. Nehemiah says, no, I'm doing a great work and I don't come down. Hello. How many of us know that um, you were focused on something? I know you never, you never had this experience before. Have you ever been focused on something and you made one mistake? Here's the one mistake. Don't press leave me after I say this. You were doing real good until you answered the phone. And when you answered the phone, God knows. We had this mother in our last church. I won't, I won't call her name out because now that we now that we uh you know we viral now and you can pick anything up on social media, I won't call her name out, but but we had this one lady and, and she used to come to church perpetually late. I mean, like 11.15, 11.20. I know you don't know nobody like that, but you know, every week she come 11.15, 11.20. It was almost assured that the only time that we knew that she was not going to be in church is after they said the prayer and they let the people in and we didn't see in the crowd with the prayer because she was notorious for coming in all the time, right? So one day we just said, Mom, what's going on? You work late or what? Well, pastor, you know, uh, miss, I almost called her name out. 
Miss, what you call it? She called me around 1045 when I'm getting ready to go to church. And before you know it, you know, I have a small conversation with her and then I'm late going out the door and then I end up being late to church. Well, you know, there is a real simple fix for this, right? Don't answer the phone. <laughs> it's just, but for some of us, it's a distraction. I'm coming back to that later. So there's so many things that take us out of worship, out of his word, out of his will, out of his way, and their temptations that are designed to distract. Nehemiah had to deal with village people, but not only did he have to deal with village people, he had to deal with rumors and uh, hypotheticals, distractions, okay? Moving along. Am I helping anybody? If you want to jump in right quick before I get to my next slide, you got something you want to say, just unmute yourself and I'll, I'll take you now. Okay. So here it is. Need to talk about these. There, there are a whole lot of causes for distraction, but there's some real root causes and things that we often find, right? So get in where you fit in. We'll talk for a minute. The first one is curiosity. How many times has our curiosity been piqued about something that all of a sudden you now stray away from doing what you're supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Anybody do internet shopping? Put your hands up. Hello. All right. Have you ever been at a time before where you're supposed to be doing something on the computer? Hello. It wasn't supposed to be internet shopping, but all of a sudden, whatever you're supposed to do, all of a sudden turns into internet shopping. And before you know it, 30 minutes then turn into 45 minutes. And now you look and you say, oh my God, where did all the time go? Hello. Why? Curiosity got you. Curiosity got you distracted. Don't press leave meeting, baby. We're going to be good. We're going to be all done about 20 minutes. Just hang on. It's all right. Right? Curiosity distracted you. Right? And here it is. I just need you to understand something, too. This may not be, this may not be deep, but this is, real, this is just really basic. Curiosity killed the cat. Yeah. You got to know. Curiosity killed the cat, right? It was a curiosity that got the cat killed. Curiosity will kill your progress. Curiosity can stunt your growth. Curiosity can take you away from the, from the purpose of the plan of God. And so you have to understand that part number one is I have to guard myself against curiosity. Hello. You don't always have to be curious, George. Or curious, George Ann. All right. Number two. Criticism. All right. I'll share with you a, a, a secret. Criticism is so powerful that sometimes your enemies know more than you do. I'll give you an example. Sometimes your enemies know so much about you that they know that one of the ways to get you halted in your tracks to stop you to keep you from moving is simply by launching criticism. Because you can spend so much time fighting criticism that you don't get any work done. Criticism, right? What somebody else says, right? Um, that's, it's, it's the truth, you know? And, and here's, here, here's, here's, here's another truth. I don't care who you are. Everybody likes to be liked. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I don't want to be liked. 
that doesn't happen. But what happens is in the process of being wanting to be liked, wanting to be loved, you're going to run up and rub against people who sometimes will give you criticism. But criticism cannot be um, your stop. Criticism cannot cause you to just get off the horse. Criticism sometimes can be the very thing that should drive you. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, Pastor, why do we allow, you know, when you know somebody may say something or you know somebody may, you know, not go with the consensus, when you know, well, listen, I don't mind hearing criticism because criticism is a form that helps people to grow sometimes. You, you learn how to grow by criticism. You learn your mistakes through criticism. You, you learn how to progress through criticism, but you don't allow the criticism to choke you out and choke the life out of you, right? Because there's some things that are called constructive criticism, and that's a good thing. But let me tell you about the other, conversely, destructive criticism. Because there's some people who will use criticism to try to destroy you, to deflate you, and to defeat you. And they know that if they say the right thing, if they level up a criticism, that it will cripple you in your walk. Ah, don't allow that to be the case, right? Criticism is one of the root causes, and we have to also guard against it, right? Uh, I hear you, Keith. Keith says, what about anger? Yeah, you did do it. Okay, bet. Yeah, anger could be a cause of distraction too. And uh, and now come the other way. But I'll, I'll take yours and, and go right there with that. Yes, anger can be a form. I mean, these were five of them. But yes, there's so many that can be added. But I'll, but since you brought it up, Keith, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to it. Anger can be a cause of distraction. Why? Because... You can stay angry for so long that you now start walking in unforgiveness. You can stay angry for so long that now um, other people have gone on with their life, but you haven't. So they're walking in their destiny and mission and you're not simply because you're angry. No, you know, you got to learn how to let go of anger so that you can get past. See, see, anger is an emotion, right? But the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Now, there is nothing wrong with having righteous anger, and there's nothing wrong with being angry for a moment, right? The problem becomes when I become angry for too long, and the problem becomes when I allow my anger to become a distraction. Here it is, I'll help you. I'm glad you brought this up, Keith. Here's, the, here's, here's where you allow anger to become a distraction. When you become so angry that you need everybody else to know that you are angry. I know you ain't never done that before. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Hello. So you, 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 you can be so angry, watch, that you now engage in victim mentality where you got to let everybody know that you're the victim. And guess what? You are the victim. But now you're victimizing other people by living in a perpetual state of anger and you're also victimizing yourself because there's some anger that you have to get to the place where you got to learn how to release it so that you can walk it so you can walk in it. How do I not allow anger to be a distraction? Last thing I'll say is I don't allow anger to be a distraction because I think about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus has a plan for my life. But I need you to know that in the plan that Jesus has for my life, I've done some things that have made him angry. But I thank God that even in the times when I've done things that have made Jesus angry, he didn't stay angry with me, but he blessed me with grace, mercy, right? And that allows me to walk in the newness of life, both before I'm saved and after I'm saved. Because I don't care how much you try to be so spiritual, everybody's had to ask God for a second chance after you got saved. Mm -hmm. 
Everybody had to ask God for some grace after we got saved. Mm-hmm. Everybody asked God to have to help us through after. But thanks be to God mm-hmm. that God doesn't stay angry. Mm-hmm. Why? Because he knows the plans that he has for us. And if he stays angry, guess what? We're cursed. Mm-hmm. We ain't going nowhere. But he helps us. Yep. Thank Sister you, Sister Doris. Amen. No, bless you, bro. Um, Sister Doris says, there's a fine line between anger and bitterness. Oh, yeah. That's a class all by itself. Because some people want to act like they're angry, but the truth is they're really bitter. And nothing worse than looking at a person who wants to claim like they're angry, but they're really bitter, and they don't even know how to diagnose it. But the worst problem is, thank you, Holy Ghost, the worst problem is when you got somebody like that, everybody sees it but them. I know you don't know nobody, so y'all just keep looking at the camera. We're going to have a good Bible study. We're going to be all right in Jesus' name. Hello. All right. So anger is one of the two, right? All right. So I took keys in there and I ins- Insert anger. We'll do that. All right. And moving on. Right. Uh, Here's another one. Procrastination. I know don't none of y'all do that, right? No, nobody procrastinates, right? Anybody? uh, Oh, this. Listen, the Bible says if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you. To all. Come on. Anybody need a cleansing? How many? How many people been? Procrastinating you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yep. There it is. Procrastination is also a distraction. Yes. Right? How many of us have put off things that we know that God has assigned for us to do, but we don't do them? And we don't do them because I'll get to that later. You know, Lord tells you a few things. Ah, well, I'll get to that. Not today, past it's snowing. I'll get to that tomorrow. Come on, y'all. Right? Think about what we, the, 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 the things and the excuses that sometimes we give to God. Right? Well, here's what we do. I know what we like to do. We like, we like to spiritualize it. Well, God knows my heart. Boo, God does know your heart. But that can't be your excuse for why you stay procrastinating. <laughs> well, you know, the Lord knows my heart. Okay, guess what? He knows everybody's heart, but he also gave you the heart. And sometimes you can't be like the brother in the Wizard of Oz. You got you to use your heart and make some moves. Distraction, right? Procrastination. So... Let's not procrastinate. If I want to do that, procrastination is one of those things. All right. The other one, of course, I'll go to the next two. Anxiety and fear. Help us, Jesus. I'll come back again. Anxiety and fear. If you need to see the five again, uh, five plus one, we'll add keeps in. That'll be six. But uh, anxiety and fear. Here it is. Um, anxiety. Sometimes we get built up to the place that we could have an anxiety episode over something that may be very real, but the anxiety is unnecessary because we built ourselves up to already think the worst. When you think the worst, you'll see the glasses half uh, empty rather than being half full, right? And so anxiety is going to be one of those things that can keep us from, ooh, I don't want to do it because, you know, I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried about, I'm worried about, I'm worried about. And I don't want to, and I don't want to, minimize worry because I don't care how spiritual we are. We all worry about something, right? It worry does come in, but the moment 
that worry permeates you to the place that it paralyzes you, that's the point where we really have to start dealing with some of this anxiety, right? And, 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 and I, I can become so worried about something that has not yet even happened. And many times our anxiety distracts us because how many of us can just be honest and say, sometimes we worry about stuff that ain't even happened yet. Thank you for the hand. Thank you for being honest, right? Anybody ever worry about something that ain't even happened yet? Okay, I'm saying, all right, good, good. The folk on the phone, they, they, can't, they can't show their hand, but I, I can vouch for them. There's some people who worry about stuff that don't happen, that hasn't happened yet, right? Now, I'm not saying this to be overly spiritual. I'm saying this to be very practical with a spiritual application, right? We worry about stuff that doesn't happen yet, but if I take Matthew 6 at its full flavor, it says, take no thought for your life. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to take care of itself. And here's the shout. Here's your own testimony. How many of us have already worried about tomorrow in times past? We worried about tomorrow in some things. And by the time we got to tomorrow, God already handled it. And for some of us, it wasn't even as bad as we thought it was going to be. You spent more time in your anxiety and God is like, you know, I, I can't speak because I, you know, I, I can't, he, he, he ain't tell me directly, but I can tell you this. I, I, I'm a paraphrase for him because I think I got a little relationship with him, but I'm like, I believe that there's some stuff that you have an anxiety for for weeks and God is laughing in the heavens like, <laughs> don't she know I already got this? <laughs> don't he know Answer. I already got this? Yes. I'm sorry. I just, it, this is, I literally just read an article on this maybe within the last couple of days, but um, some years ago, Huffington Post posted an article and the title of the article was 85% of what we worry about never happens. They actually did a study. And so 85% of the people that were in, in the study, what they were worried about never, ever manifested like ever in their lives that they could even recall. And then of the 15% that it did manifest for, those people found out that it was a lot easier for them to deal with than they ever anticipated. So they even had an irrational fear with inside of the anxiety that likely with, with that they're saying that is most of the time it doesn't even manifest itself. <laughs> and then when it does, we already have the tools to deal with it. So I just wanted to add that to what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, I think about the times that you get yourself worked up, right? We get ourselves worked up, worked up, worked up, worked up, right? Blood pressure going, this, that, the third, heart racing, all of that. And ah, it's not that bad, you know? Um, anxiety about what it's going to be like. Uh, have you ever been in this place before where you procrastinated in anxiety over the potential of what you thought it was going to be like only to find out when you do it, it wasn't so bad after all. Right? So therefore, here you are, and, and sometimes you can procrastinate and procrastinate and worry about something, and God says, I've already got this handled. I'm laughing at you. Right? Here's the thing. I'll give you, I'll give you this. Let, let's look at this. I'll give you the, I'll give you the fast the fast forward version of this, right? Um, the Bible says, and Reverend Carter, help me with this. Just just pull me out when Peter's sinking, uh, in, in, in when Peter when Peter's sinking, um, in the water. The Bible says that the Peter, uh, they're in the storm, and Peter, uh, sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. And he sees Jesus, and the Bible says that Peter says unto him, you hear me, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. Peter starts walking on water. 
The Bible says he saw something, the wind. He saw something, the wave, boisterous, right? He saw the elements of the storm, and now he begins to fall in to the water. But the Bible also says that Jesus stretches out his arm and pulls him out. Here's the point where I want us to just focus on. We're doing Bible study, and I'm, and I'm walking you through it. In order for Jesus to be able to pull his arm out and pull Peter from the water, Peter had to be ultimately very close to Jesus in order for him to do it. And so many times our anxiety hits us at a place where we are so close to the blessing, so close to the miracle, so close to what God is getting ready to do. And all of a sudden we start getting Peter syndrome. How many has that ever been your testimony? You were so close or you had to find out after the anxiety just how close you were and it wasn't so bad after all. And then you get mad and you go home and kick the dog talking about how much time you wasted. Don't blame the dog. That wasn't it. That wasn't their fault. That's our fault. Right? We do that to ourselves. So fear and procrastination and anxiety, these are things that can really come into our life to keep us distracted, right? Don't get distracted by the anxiety because the anxiety is many times triggered by a fear about what's going to happen. But Jesus tells us you can't do anything to add one cubit to your stature. So why are we worried? Why are we in anxiety? So we have to shift our prayer, right? And, and, I, and once again, I'm not here to minimize, right? Because there's certain people who have, you know, anxiety disorders. There's certain people who, you know, anxiety is what you have because you've had enough bad experiences. But what I am here to say is use some spiritual discipline to help to navigate you through faith, prayer, counseling, right? Jesus and the therapist will help with and with, 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 when it comes to anxiety sometimes, being able to talk it through, right? Because many times when we're worried about something, sometimes we can't even articulate to others what we're worried about because it just feels a certain type of way to us, right? And so, um, you know, prayer does fit into your anxiety because prayer is this, this is what prayer does, right? Prayer fits into the anxiety because prayer, if we're praying correctly, prayer begins with me speaking to God, but prayer also ends with God speaking to me. So how does prayer enter in anxiety? When I pray, I'm inviting God into my anxiety. I'm inviting God into my chaos. I'm inviting God into my storm. And when I pray and invite God into my storm, all God has to do is say, peace be still, and the whole game changes. Come on, somebody. Thank you. The whole game changes. And for all of us, this is why it's Bible study. We get a chance to go back and, 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 and find your own shout, slow talking to find your shout. How many times have you been in the middle of something and God spoke to you and took care of it and handled it? Sometimes, I come on now, I just be honest. You know, there were times early in my spiritual immaturity and walk with God. You know, God had to, you know, God had to grab me and say, "Hey, boy, get your get your life right. Get 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 your get your life. What what, what you what? 
You gonna freak out about this? Get yourself together. You gonna lose your mind about this? You you gonna trip out about this? You know? Well, I got this illness. Okay, but you got other people on the brink of death. You gonna trip out about this? Well, I, you know, I I I I got. I got money issues. I need you to know the people at the top got money issues. Mm-hmm. By the way, you know, find your own shout in this. If you find yourself, you talk about you in debt and you about to lose your mind because you in debt. Guess what? America's in debt. Now, come on. Now, that ain't, that, that's not going to be our license to want to stay in debt. But it's a license for us to handle our anxiety in such a way that our our anxiety does not overtake us, right? There are some things that you can bring into your scope not to allow the anxiety overtake you. Are we helping? All right? Um, And so... Let me see what else I got for you here. I think I have one more and I'll share it. Well, do I? And then I, I, I'll come to that up uh, maybe, well, I'll do that this week and I'll just say that and I'll close out on this. You know, um, and we'll read, the, I'll encourage you to go and read uh, Ezra chapter four when you get home. Take that as your homework, Ezra chapter number four. Uh, I think it's somewhere between verses one through five. But in this, um, they too, uh, the people of God, the remnant are rebuilding and reviving. And the Bible says that the word, they hired um, lawyers to frustrate their purpose. That's what it says in Ezra chapter number four. And so sometimes I, what the enemy does is he uses tactics to frustrate our purpose with the hope of distracting us. Distractions sometimes lead to frustration and frustration takes us out of our game, takes us out of our walk, right? So here's a frustration that some people have. We want to go big real quick. So, um, we got a big goal and we want to go big real quick. And because we haven't hit it big, got it big, we become angry, frustrated. Here's a challenge. The challenge is this, is that sometimes I can't allow frustration to get me simply because uh, I'll use a baseball analogy. I can't become frustrated because every time I step up to the plate, I don't hit a home run. If you have a, if you step up to the plate and you hit a single, and then you hit another single, and then you hit another single, and then you hit another single, it takes four singles to get across the plate for you to get to a home run. Guess what? You're there. But if you're saying all I'm trying to do is go for the home run, and you end up striking out, well, maybe you ought to start aiming for some singles. Don't go big, go small. And here's the Bible for you so it can help you. The Bible says, um, despise not the day of small beginnings, right? In other words, I don't allow small incremental accomplishments and or setbacks to rule me. All right. We only did this today. Catch me next time. Reverend Carga, I mean, I see my my pastors, I mean, my pastors and preachers. I said, I tried to make this my mantra in life. I know for a fact every week Pastor Jaime preaches, 52 weeks out the year, it may not be a good week preaching. We all do it. You know, may not be a good week serving, choir, singing. May not be a good week singing. May not be that, may not be that week. Here it is, right? My goal is this. I may have a bad one, but it ain't going to be back to back. 
Why? I, I've set myself up to overcome these things. And when you do, you overcome it. But if not, you become distracted by it. Well, I didn't do that this week. Oh man, it really didn't go well this week. It didn't go this week. Then you stand up again next week and now you're worried about what you did last week. And guess what? You keep going over and over and over again to the place now that you become frustrated. And now your distraction has now led to a place of frustration. And that my brothers and sisters is not what God desires for us. He desires for us to overcome distractions. And the way we overcome distractions is through something called focus. And um, we'll get, we'll finish that up maybe next week, or we'll just send you the notes and we'll move on to the next thing uh, for next Bible study. Amen.